All right, can you hear me back there? Dansby? Can he hear me? He, <laughs> he doesn't hear well? I'm talking to you, Dansby. <laughs> huh? <laughs> I thought maybe he just didn't listen to you when you talked. Check. I don't know. They say that uh, women say twice as many words a day as men. My wife was telling me that. And I said, she said, did you know we, re we say two times as many words as you do? And I said, what? Hi, Trish. Who's your friend? She, she's the lady with the boxes, Dottie's boxes. We're about two minutes before we go live, so we're okay. Aren't you always short? <laughs> Right. Can you see me as the mayor of El Paso? No, I couldn't. No. Thanks for asking. Maybe the mayor of Merkel. That's a different thing. That's right. Hello there. Me and my drink are here. Good. Do we get a new one today? No. I really enjoy your class. You're doing you well. That's right. For a good grade. Hi, Bob Bine. Uh, 49ers and Chiefs. Yeah, I know. No, I'm asking you. Oh, uh, probably the 49ers. Yeah, I'm trying to, I'm trying to, I'm trying to but, I mean, I like both of them. That's the deal. Well, sure. If they had a coach make better decisions, it'd be okay. If we don't go for it on fourth down in the early in the first in the game, kick a field goal, we may end up winning that game. I know. Coaches make bad decisions. I don't know. I just steal them from everywhere. Oh, no. <laughs> it's me. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> yeah, I heard that. Karen Dansby. Is my wife a lovely person? Oh, she is lovely. Okay. My wife is an angel. She's always up in the air harping about something. <laughs> that was for her. <laughs> That's right. You're harping about. It. Speaking of another harper, hello there, Smith. <laughs> Thank you. All righty, 6 o'clock. That means we have gone live, as they like to say. Remember that old commercial, is it live or is it Memorex? Are y'all old enough to know that one? Ah, live or Memorex? You probably aren't old enough to know that. It's because you're exceedingly young is what it is. <laughs> Speaking of young, we have another young one who just came in. That's good. And then you'll be old after a couple of more days? Okay. Uh, you can have any color you want. The last one we've done is this uh, smoke gray thing. And really, that's the one that you'll need tonight because of us looking at the maps on the back. 
<clears throat> but feel free to take any and all that you wish, and we can always make more. Uh, whatever color that is, you can have it. But the smoke gray one is the most important one. <sighs> he probably already has one. All right, let's talk about some stuff from a calendaring aspect of it all while you're picking up things along the way. Uh, so we are doing tonight, and then we will do uh, next Wednesday night, which actually will take us into February. I guess that'll like, be like February 7, maybe. And then two weeks from tonight, we're going to pause. We're not going to do two weeks from tonight because that's when the church does uh, what's called Ash Wednesday. And so the whole sanctuary will be in use by the, by the church and the staff and everybody else. Which got me wondering, I noticed everything's been removed from the stage. There's no chairs, there's nothing in the choir loft. Do you know why it, there's nothing up there? Okay. So anyway, uh, we'll have to see when we come back on Sunday if somebody puts some things up there for people to sit on. So, and then again, I don't, we don't, we probably don't have too many more uh, Wednesdays in this, maybe three or so, so we'll see. And then after that's over, we'll shift gears and go from Bible back over to history kinds of things, church history type things. And I think I'm looking at maybe doing a history of the Bible, how we got the Bible, the English Bible, because you asked for it. That's right. Anything you want. All right. So, but again, if you are tuned in, if you're watching us or listening to us, anytime if you need some of these things that we have, just contact the church, ask for Jeannie Wesley, and she will get you anything that you need along the way. All right. So let's think about where we are right now. And uh, see if we can pay attention a little bit. If, if you're wanting to keep up in a rolling fashion, if you still have your uh, bottle rocket blue outline, let's try and think of the name of it again. We're on page five, and, and all it's doing is just kind of walking us through the chapters along the way. That's another, I might make that for you later. Uh, one of the ways to learn a book of the Bible is just kind of know something that's in each chapter. And then you can just sort of walk yourself through uh, a book of the Bible just by knowing what's in each chapter. But we're on uh, page five tonight. And you can see it goes on over to six. And so we'll be, we'll be done at, at some time pretty soon down the road. What chapter are we in? Do you know? Uh, 19? No, that's too far. Yeah, let's uh, back up to 17. We're going to back it up to 17 and, and start there. Merkel Man is not here tonight. If you're watching, buddy, we really need you. We never know where we are without you. But anyway, so let's go to chapter 17, which you're looking at, at uh, page 5. We're calling this the Wilderness Civil War. Remember what's taking place is once in, uh, we're in 2 Samuel, if, if you'd forgotten. Once... Uh, you know, the, David got off to a great start. Woohoo! Chapters 1 through 10, he is the best guy in the world. Chapter 11 and 12, he crashes and burns with the David and Bathsheba story. Chapter 13 on is now starting with uh, rebellion and troubles in his family, involving mainly a guy, a son, by the name of Absalom. And so this, you can see how everything changes in life, and that's again things that you and I have always had to wrestle with also, is consistency and seeing what happens when, when things kind of get messed up. So what's happened here is in chapter uh, 17, let's just sort of back it up to 17 and get this running start. I was talking to my class uh, yesterday again about the how all the the books that are ones and twos in the Old Testament are just one book in the Hebrew Bible. So first and second Samuel is really just Samuel. That's why the, the book continues on. All right, chapter 17. If you remember, uh, as we said last week, uh, it's, it's really like reading a novel 
Uh, you get to see a lot of character development. You get to see some uh, political intrigue going in and out of the lives of these people. And so what's, what's taking place in chapter 17 is David is now beginning to uh, escape, if that's the right word, from his son. So if you've got the smoke gray one, if you look on the, the side that's got the two maps, you look on the side with the two maps. Okay, so the map at the top is what we're doing right now. You'll notice it says 2 Samuel 15 through 18. And so this is, this is a picture of uh, Absalom's rebellion, Absalom's revolt. He has decided he doesn't like his father at all. He wants to kill his father. He wants to take over as the king. He has staged a revolt, which actually started, uh, if you drop down south of Jerusalem, down to a town named Hebron. And so he called everybody together at Hebron to meet him there. And he said, David's not your king anymore. I am. And so then they moved up to Jerusalem and off they go. So all David did, we talked about this last week, was they vacated Jerusalem and he is now heading across the Jordan River. He's going to get over on this other side of the river, again with the process of wanting just to stay away from Absalom. He's not afraid of him. He just doesn't want to fight him. He's going to leave all that up to God, let God handle it, just the same way he did back in 1 Samuel when Saul was chasing him all over the place. Uh, one thing just uh, from a background effort, in case you don't know all these words, if you're looking at the map where the arrow crosses the Jordan River, over on this side, yes, yeah. on your map, okay. <clears throat> That's what we call the Transjordan Plateau. Uh, no, all I'm trying to, to give you here is some sense of texture. Have any of you been to Israel? No. no? If Lynn were here, Lynn, Lynn's been to, to Israel. But <clears throat> when you leave Jerusalem, as I was telling you last week, when you leave Jerusalem, Jerusalem is about 2,600 feet above sea level. That doesn't mean anything to my students or whatever when we talk about that. Um, what's Abilene's elevation? 1735. We got somebody who knows elevations right here. Uh, we'll call him Otis because he built elevators. Uh, but no, uh, so 1735. But again, it takes us, it takes Abilene from the Gulf of Mexico to get up to 1735. Make sense? Okay. But if you're looking at your map, See, right over here is the coastline. Here's the Mediterranean Sea, if you're familiar with that term. Oh, even says it on the map, Mediterranean Sea. Why is it called Mediterranean? <laughs> so it'd be hard to spell, that's why. No, be because it's meta, middle, terrain, earth, middle of the earth. That's how the Romans viewed it as sort of the middle of the earth. And so... Uh, when you're over there, you're at sea level. Does that make sense? Well, it's about 25 miles to go from the coast to Jerusalem, and you go up 2,600 feet. There's very few flat places on this map. That's why in the Bible it always talks about going up to Jerusalem, because you're always making an ascent no matter which direction you come from. So then you're about 2,600 feet above, and then you drop down, you go down the hillside, down the hillside, down the hillside. The Jordan River, whoa, do you see it on the map? Yep, yep Jordan River. The Jordan River, this, what they're calling the Sea of Galilee, and what they're calling the Dead Sea, all of that is below sea level. Mm -hmm. So there's a huge, for my geology people, there's a huge geological rift valley that runs through there. The tectonic plate shifted and everything else, and the whole land just dropped off. The Sea of Galilee is about 700 feet below sea level. Jordan River goes down, 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 down till you get to the Dead Sea. 
which is about 1,300 feet below sea level. So from Jerusalem, well, actually I drew the Dead Sea down too far, if you will, <clears throat> but from Jerusalem to the Dead Sea is about mm, 15 miles, and you go from 2,600 above to 1,300 below. You drop 3,900 feet in 15 miles. So you're, David is cascading down this, this uh, mountainside and gets down, if you're following your arrow, gets down to the Jordan River, crosses over, and then this side, which is the Transjordan Plateau, <clears throat> this was like the Western Highlands. So the Transjordan Plateau puts you right back up in the mountains, like you know, 2,000 feet above sea level, that kind of stuff. So it, it, you just have this huge gash that runs right down the middle of this, of this map. So by going down the hillside, as soon as he crosses the Jordan River, he's got, they got to begin their climbing of the mountains to get back on that other side if you're following the arrow there. Okay, that was just a little geo, geographical background. I always remind my students, I tell them things like this just to remind them that this stuff is real. Real land, real geography, real history, real, everything's real. It's not made up, it's, it's real. Okay, so chapter 17, back to the story. Uh, come down, oh, it started about verse 21, I'm in 1721. Uh, after they had gone, the men came up out of the well, went and told King David, go and cross the water quickly. See, get across that river. We got to get across that river. Go and cross the water quickly. For thus and so has Ahithophel counseled against you. Now, if you remember from last week, Absalom has two main political advisors. One is Ahithophel and the other is Hushai. Uh, one of them is definitely against David and the other one is more of a spy for David and under cutter, if you will. But Ahithophel is definitely doesn't like David. Uh, and so 22, David and all the people who were with him set out, crossed the Jordan. So we're getting across the river now. Uh, by daybreak, not one was left who had not crossed the Jordan. When Ahithophel saw that his counsel was not followed, now this was part of the deal. Ahithophel said, hey, David is starting to get away. Let's go now and kill him. And the other guy who's trying to help David out, Hushai, said, no, David's a pretty good warrior. Why don't we take time to gather all of our people together? Uh, you know, he's trying to delay the attack against David is what he's trying to do. And so Absalom ended up listening to Hushai, not Ahithophel. So when, uh, 23, when Ahithophel saw his counsel was not followed, he gets on his donkey, goes home, sets his house in order, and what does your Bible say? Hanged himself. Hanged himself. Wow. He died and was buried in the tomb of his father. Because he saw this as a huge uh, insult that the king had taken the counsel of someone else. And so he, he just decides that's it, I'm done. And uh, he hung himself. So David crossed over, 24, goes to that town you've probably never heard of, Mahanaim, which is on the map. You can see that's where the arrow is going on the map. And uh, he has the men of Israel with him. Here comes Absalom, 25, and he's got people to help him. And they're gonna, he's going to end up crossing the river too. So it's just showing how what David is getting over on the other side. I always like what this says. Come down to 27, uh, 17, 27. When David came to Mahanaim, this person you've never heard of, and other people you've never heard of, 28, brought beds, basins, earthen vessels, wheat, barley meal, parched grains, beans, lentils, honey, curd, sheep, cheese from the herd, for David and the people were hungry and thirsty and weary. Uh, how does a writer know all that? Have you ever thought about that? How to, I mean, that's a pretty, pretty good list there of stuff. How does he know that? Oral 
Yeah, but probably, and, and we've tried to say this ever since we even started the Saul part, uh, kings did have people who recorded all of their activities. So you have these kingly records uh, that would be, I want to say on file, they didn't file things, but they had these kingly records that could be looked at and compared and analyzed and, and used as background material. So that's probably how he knows that whole list of stuff. It almost sounds like a, a disciple now list. These are the things we need for a disciple now. Bring beans and spelt and millet and all this other stuff. Mm -hmm. Sure, and on, and on that side again, you've got farmers and you've got people who are able to, to grow certain things. So the point is, he's just trying to show us David is across the river. He's now on the Transjordan Plateau. Chapter 18, <clears throat> he, has, he has escaped. Well, get down to chapter 18. David mustered the men who were with him drew uh, commanders of thousands, commanders of hundreds. He divides the army into three groups. Again, this is stuff you would get from these official records. One third, now this is kind of interesting because of what's going to happen later. Verse uh, two, one third was under the command of Joab. We know him, like David's main general in his army. Okay, He's going to come back into the story. One-third under Abishai's son, Joab's brother. One-third under Ittai the Gittite. Guy's got a lot of T's in his name here. And so the king, now here, this is an important thing. The king says, okay, I will go with you. So I got these three uh, groups, cadres of people to go. And he says, I'll go with you. That makes sense. That's usually what happens. But three, but the men said, no, no, don't go out. Because if something happens to us, if, we're, if we lose, if we're fleeing, if we're trying to answer our phone when it rings, we, <laughs> we won't. Is that David? Okay. That's okay. Uh, don't go out because if we're losing, we won't know what to do. If half of us die, they don't care about us. You're worth 10,000 of us. Remember, that's the whole reason Absalom's chasing him. So you stay here, and we'll go do the fighting. So the king said, okay, whatever seems best to you, I'm going to do. So he stands by the gate. Here goes the army. Uh, the king orders those three guys, Joab, Abishai, Ittai. Now here's the key sentence. If you like to underline or color in your Bible, uh, 18, 5, the king ordered Joab, Abishai, and Ittai, saying, deal gently for my sake with the young man Absalom. Uh, I'm hearing the sadness of a father, realizes he'd kind of messed stuff up, <laughs> trying to help out the... Uh, the young man, Absalom. So he's telling the guys, the commanders, deal gently with him. And all the people heard that. The king gave those orders. That's important for what's going to happen. And so Absalom's chasing him. They're fleeing. They're getting to the point that there's nowhere else to go. We're going to have to fight. So David's got him in those three groups. You know, if you can... Deal gently with Absalom. So six, the army went out into the field. Battle was fought in the forest of Ephraim. Does your Bible say Ephraim? Okay, that's uh, as one of the 12 tribes of Israel. It's one of the two sons of Joseph, uh, Ephraim and Manasseh. And so in the forest, in their area, remember when they divided up the land, if you go back to the book of Joshua, when we did Joshua. And so they, up in the forest, that's where the battle is taking place. The men of Israel were defeated. Now, every time it says men of Israel, remember Absalom has declared himself the new king. And he has taken over the palace in Jerusalem. So men of Israel means his guys. So when the men of Israel... 
<clears throat> fought, they were defeated by the servants of David. Slaughter was great, 20,000 guys, battle spread over the face of the country. <laughs> this is an interesting sentence halfway through eight. The forest claimed more victims that day than the sword. Kind of descriptive, almost poetic, if you will. All the people who died there in the forest. Now, let's bring Absalom back in the story. I'm in 18.9. Absalom happened to meet the servants of David. So, remember they told David to stay home from, or stay in the camp from the battle, but Absalom is with his people while they're fighting. Absalom is riding on his mule. Does your Bible say mule? Yes? Now, I don't know a lot about mules. I've never lived in Merkel. Uh, but, you know, that's just one of the animals that they uh, rode. Donkeys, mules. Okay. Uh, he was riding on his mule. The mule went under the thick branches of a great oak. His head caught fast in the oak. Maybe this is what it means where the forest claimed victims. His head caught fast in the oak. He was left hanging between heaven and earth while the mule that was under him went on. So his branch pulls him off of the animal. I don't know if it was because of his hair. Remember the thing about his hair where he cut it once a year? Some of you in this room cut your hair once a year, but, you know, it's because you don't have any. But he would cut his and weigh it out and everything else. I wasn't looking at you, Tucker. All right, but anyway, so he's caught up, you know, whoop, off of the animal. He's hanging from this tree. Verse 10, a man saw it, told Joab. Remember, Joab's one of the three leaders. I saw Absalom hanging in an oak. Joab said to the man, What? You saw him? Why then did you not strike him there to the ground? I would have been glad to give you ten pieces of silver and a belt. He said, Wait a minute. Didn't David tell Joab to deal gently with the guy? You're starting to hear again this under rumbling of issues between David and Joab that we've that we've encountered, you know, pretty much through most of 2 Samuel. But the guy said to Joab, "Well, even if I had all that, I would not raise my hand against the king's son. You heard him. It was in our hearing the king commanded you and Abishai and Ittai saying for my sake protect the young man Absalom." Hmm, a little bit of honor. See, sometimes what the world wants us to do is one thing. What God wants us to do is something else. And we have to make choices along the way. And here's a guy that made a choice. Even if Joab could pay him all that kind of stuff, he says, nope, not doing it. Because remember, that's what David said. So think about that. Next time you have to make a choice of something uh, along the way. So. Let's see what happens. Let's see if that pacified Joab. 14. Joab said, I'm not going to waste time like this with you. He took three spears in his hand and thrust them into the heart of Absalom while, while he was still alive in the oak. Now, see if I'm reading this for the first time, I'm kind of expecting it to say that, you know, Joab realized, whoop, I was wrong. So they go to where Absalom is, and they cut him down out of the tree, and they take him to David. That's what I'm expecting to read. <clears throat> but that's not what I'm reading. Is that true? So it says this, I'm going to say defenseless, if you will, uh, person Absalom is hanging from a tree, has now three spears thrust into his heart, and, 15, 10 young men, Joab's armor bearers, surrounded Absalom, struck him, and killed him. So there's Joab doing exactly what David told him not to do. Hmm, something to think about. 16, uh, so Joab, I'm in chapter 18, verse 16. 
Joab sounded the trumpet, troops come back. They took Absalom, threw him into a great pit in the forest, raised over him a very great heap of stones. All of the Israelites, now those would be Absalom's people, all of the Israelites fled to their homes. Absalom in his lifetime had taken and set up for himself a pillar. Uh, he said, I have no son to keep my name in remembrance. And, and here's an interesting remark. Uh, look at verse 18. Uh, not so much for what it says, but why it says it. At the end of 18, he says he set up a pillar, and it's called Absalom's Monument. Does your Bible say that? Yes. To this day. Did you have to this day? Yes. Okay. So that's a reminder that whoever is writing this thing, whenever they're writing it, he said it's still there. You can go look at it. So... You know, again, it, does, it shows us that it's not somebody who's walking around and just jotting down stuff as he watches it happen, but it's the writer has looked at these records and finds out things and says it's, it's there even to this day. You can go see it. You know, we do that sometimes. There's some historical thing in Abilene, and we say, you, you can still go look at it. You know, we used to have this old uh, motel that sat on East, A East Highway 80, and parts of it are still there. You can go look at it. So it's just a very interesting literary statement that is made, showing us again the, the physicality of the Bible being put together under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. All right, verse 19. Then some guy you don't know said, Let me run and carry tidings to the king that the Lord has delivered him from the power of his enemies. Joab said, No! You're not to carry tidings today. You can carry tidings some other day. But today you're not going to do so because the king's son is dead. So Joab told a lesser person, a Cushite, go tell the king what you've seen. So the Cushite bowed before Job, Joab and ran. I think I said Job a minute ago. I'm going to say Joab. Joab and ran. And the, that guy said, can I run with the Cushite? Why will you run, seeing that you have no reward for the tidings? Come on, May, he says, I'm going to run. He said, okay, run. <laughs> what do I care? <laughs> so he ran by the plane, and, and actually, I like what it says at the end of 23, he outran the Cushite. So whoosh, passes him <laughs> as he's going to go tell David what's happened. Now, again, remember what's, what's taking place. David is unaware of all of this. He's in the camp. He knows his guys are fighting those guys. But he also knows he would like to see his son again. And he is given a kingly order to address that. <clears throat> so look at this last... Uh, a couple of paragraphs of chapter 18. It's a very uh, poignant section of the story. Uh, David sitting between the two gates. I'm in verse 24, 18, 24. David sitting between the gates. Here comes the sentinel went up by the wall. Here's the guy running. The sentinel shouted and told the king. The king said, if he's alone, there are tidings in his mouth. He kept coming. He drew near. The sentinel saw another man running. Here's another guy running. Well, he's also bringing tidings. I think the running of the first one, he looks like. <laughs> Do you run in such a way that people know it's you running? That's interesting. If anybody sees me running, there's going to be something wrong. <laughs> I can't imagine me running anymore. Uh, I think it's, it looks like that Ahimahaz, son of Zadok, King said, okay, he's a good man. He's going to have good tidings. Ah, David's hoping. You hear hope built into the king and what he's hoping to hear. So the guy comes running in, verse 28, all is well, bows down before the king. Blessed be the Lord, Baruch Hashem Adonai. Blessed be the Lord, your God, who has delivered up the men who raised their hand against the Lord my king. So his, his immediate tidings is, David, woo, you won. Praise the Lord. God has given victory to your people. 
your enemies have been vanquished. Now, what you're going to hear is David doesn't care about any of this. I know. But anyway, so it's good news. It is good tidings, I guess. And he figures that's what the king wants to hear. Uh, the king said, 29. Notice he didn't say, yay, we won, or praise the Lord. He said, verse 29, is it well with the young man Absalom? See, that's his first thing to talk about. Uh, the guy said, well, when Joab sent your servant, I saw a great tumult. I do not know what it was. And I don't know if that's entirely true or if he's just trying to say it in nice words. The king said, okay, turn aside, stand here. The guy's resting. The fast runner is resting. Here comes runner number two, the guy who lost the race. Uh, in verse 31, good tidings for my lord, the king. For the Lord, uh, my Bible, every time I, I see this, my Bible has Lord in all capital letters. Yes. What does that mean? What? Somebody said it. What? Yahweh. Yahweh. Again, if your Bible has Lord, all capital letters, that's the way your translators handle the name of God, which is Yahweh. Okay? As distinguished from like this. Okay. So, Lord was in that guy's first pronouncement in verse 28. Blessed be the Lord. Blessed be Yahweh your God. And, and here it is in verse 31. Well, in fact, my Bible, I don't know if yours does this. Go back to verse 31 for a minute. Then the Cushite came, and the Cushite said, Good tidings for my Lord the King. Does your Bible say Lord the King? Yes. Yes. And it's, it's this kind of Lord. That word. Yeah. Yeah, with the small. Yeah, and even a small L. Yeah, sure. Uh, Hebrew word there is Adonai. Someone who functions as a Lord, a leader of something, the Lord of something. And then it says... Good tidings for my Lord, little L, the king, for the Lord, capital letters, for Yahweh. So you get to see the, the, the two words kind of in juxtaposition of each other. For Yahweh has vindicated you this day, delivering you from the power of all who rose up against you. So that's like a repeat of what the fast runner told him. So verse 32, does David seem to care about that? No. King said to Cushite, is it well with the young man Absalom? Exact same things he asked the first guy. He got that little fuzzy answer from the first guy. Uh, this guy said, the Cushite answered, may the enemies of my lord, the king, and all who rise up to do you harm be like that young man. Meaning, he's dead. All your enemies should die. Everybody who tries to oppose you should meet the same fate of being dead. And so now you have one, as I said, one of the most poignant sentences ever written in the Old Testament. The king was deeply moved, verse 33, went up to the chamber over the gate and wept as he went. And he said, oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom. Would that I had died instead of you, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Yeah. I hear a, a broken heart by this father realizing how bad things had gone. And so he's had a number of his kiddos die while he's been the king. And again, this is partly in connection with the David and Bathsheba story. Everything changes. It's a reminder to us that if and when we choose to sin, it doesn't just impact us. It impacts others too. Families, friends, churches. Everybody is, our lives touch so many people. So that's what you have here at the end of chapter 18. So this is why... Uh, 
we, we've sort of finished that section of the story. David has survived, if you will, the first revolt, this Absalom's rebellion, you can see ends it at 1833. So what's going to happen now, physically, remember David's over here. So he's got to get back over here to Jerusalem to reclaim his kingdom. And this is sort of what chapter 19 is about. He's going to attempt to put this disorganized, broken kingdom back together. That's another thing you pick up at this time is that, I mean, I guess David has every right to do whatever he wants to do to all those people who opposed him. You know, sometimes we like to lash out at people who get in our way or say bad things about us or something like that. But we're going to have to watch and see what David does if he's going to respond that way or a different way. Chapter 19. It was told Joab, the king is weeping and mourning for Absalom. Victory that day had turned into mourning for the troops when they heard that. The king is grieving for his son. The troops stolen to the city that day as soldiers steal in who are ashamed when they flee in battle. The king covered his face. Oh, my son, Absalom. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Um, in Hebrew... When you repeat a word, uh, it it's shows intensity. So Absalom, Absalom shows intensity. My son, my son shows intensity. <laughs> Joab came into the house to the king. And Joab pretty much uh, calls David on the carpet. Now remember, though, we got problems already between David and Joab. Sure, one of those pages I think tells you that, right? Um, see verse 5. Today you have covered your face, you've covered with shame the faces of all your officers who saved your life today. The love of those who hate you, the hatred of those who love you. And so he's sort of like saying, we went to battle for you and we won and you're making everybody feel bad for it. But again, remember David didn't really care about the battle. Verse, uh, what is this, uh, six, about halfway through, you've made it clear today that the commanders and officers are nothing to you. I perceive that if Absalom were alive and all of us were dead, you would be pleased. See, just sort of, you know, taking him to task, speaking to him very brusquely. So why don't you go out and speak kindly to your servants? I swear by Yahweh, if you do not go, not a person will stay with you this night, and it'll be worse for you. So I guess the king took that under advice, verse 8. He got up, took his seat in the gate. The troops were told the king is sitting in the gate, and all the troops came before the king. So he had gone up to his own quarters above the gate, if you remember at the end of chapter 18. So here are all these troops. They don't really know what to do. What's the problem? Why is the king not here? So after kind of point blank pointed uh, dialogue with Joab, I guess he realizes I probably ought to come down and take my seat and get everybody, get the troops together. So very interesting to see that kind of event. So those Israelites, I'm still in eight. Remember, Israelites means Absalom's people. They had fled to their homes, and so we got problems everywhere, all throughout the tribes of Israel. The king has delivered us from the hand of our enemies. He saved us from the Philistines, and now he's fled out of the land because of Absalom. But now Absalom, who we anointed to go over us, is dead. So should we bring the king back? Why are we not talking about bringing the king back? Because we'd had a rebellion, we'd had a revolt. All these people over here had pretty much said, Absalom, you the guy. And now they realized we made a bad choice. Maybe we need to bring him back. Verse 11. So King David sent this message to the, the priests Zadok and Abiathar. He had left those priests back in Jerusalem to kind of tend the... Uh, the uh, Ark of the Covenant, 
and to take care of it. So he says, say to the elders of Judah, why should you be the last to bring the king back to his house? The talk of all Israel has come to the king. You're my kin, verse 12. uh, David was from the tribe of Judah. That's why earlier in 2 Samuel, like chapter 2, after Saul had died, Judah, which is mainly down like in this area, Judah had uh, asked David to be the king, but the rest of the people had not. So it says for about seven years, he had ruled from Hebron, and then he went up and captured Jerusalem. You remember some of this stuff at the beginning of 2 Samuel? He went up and captured Jerusalem, and by this time, everybody had signed on with David. But now, everybody had kind of switched allegiance to Absalom. And then their guy lost. So they say, hmm, Judah, you're, you're my kin. Maybe you should lead the way in bringing me back. Are you not, 13, are you not my bone and my flesh? So 14, this guy that you don't know, Amasah, swayed the hearts of the people of Judah as one. They said to the king, return, you and your servants. So the king came back to the Jordan. So once again, now this time we're coming down the hillside to get back to the Jordan River. And Judah came to Gilgal, I'll come back to that, to meet the king and to bring him over the Jordan. Anybody remember Gilgal? Female fish? No, Gilgal. Uh, I'm sorry, I just made that up. I'd never said that in my life. Uh, but anyway, uh, goes back to the book of Joshua. Some of you were around when we did Joshua. <clears throat> in the book of Joshua, the people started over here and they came down to the Jordan River. And just on the other side of the river was a town called Gilgal. Uh, they had come across the river. The river had actually divided for them. They crossed over. They picked up stones. They built Uh, monuments and things there in Gilgal and Gilgal had become their their base of operations during their invasion back in the book of Joshua so Gilgal had been a very very significant city throughout these historical stages Joshua judges first Samuel second Samuel Gilgal is a really important place oh There it is on the bottom map if you want to see where Gilgal is located. But so they go to Gilgal to meet the king. We'll be talking about the bottom map next week. And to bring him over the Jordan. So here comes a bunch of people that you don't know. And they came with him to meet King David, 17,000 people from Benjamin. Now, technically, Jerusalem is in the tribe of Benjamin's area. A little small tribal place. But, you know, that's why it's so important to get the people of Benjamin connected with this too. So here come 15 sons, 20 servants, rushed down to the Jordan. Crossing was taking place, bringing over the king's household to do his pleasure. So you can see the people are now really turning out to bring David back is what's happening. Uh, Some people are apologizing for deserting him, this Shemai guy. Verse uh, 18, and your servant knows, 20, that I have sinned. Therefore, I've come this day, the first of all the house of Joseph, to come down and meet my Lord. Now, here's the, the last thing we want to say today. Come down to 22, uh, 21. Now, watch what happens. Abishai, if you remember, Abishai was one of those three military leaders. Abishai said, shall not Shemai be put to death for this uh, turning against you stuff that he did? Because he cursed Yahweh's anointed one. That's uh, the term they would use for the king. Yahweh's Meshach, where we get our word Messiah. Uh, David said, now remember he has every right 
to say, yes, kill him right now. In fact, a lot of rulers or leaders would have done that. But David said, what do I have to do with you that you should today become an adversary to me? Shall anyone be put to death in Israel this day? For do I not know that I am this day king over Israel? So he said to Shammai, you're not going to die. And the king gave him his oath. So here's a good reminder to us as we close down tonight. The importance of trusting God when things run afoul in our relationships or in our world that we're living in. We do not have to act like the world says we have to act. We follow the leadership of the Lord. David had every right to kill him. He says, nope, 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 nobody dies. We're doing good. Forgiveness is a big thing for God's people. Old Testament talks about it. New Testament talks about it. Jesus talks about it. Forgiveness is pretty good. So think about those people who might have offended you in some way or come against you in some way. And think about either treating them the way the world says you can or forgiving them. When we come back next week, we'll get David back in Jerusalem. We'll see one more rebellion take place as the writer begins to wrap up the life of David um, to take us to the end. I think chapter 24, I believe, is the end of it all. So we'll see how far we make it next week. And then remember, two weeks from tonight, we don't meet. I'll remind you. What? Well, a lot of these towns or cities, he's asking about Gilgal, if it's still there. A lot of them have become villages or just little vestiges of being there. Now, if you go back to Joshua, the reason, again, Gilgal was so important is it sits right next to Jericho. And that's the first town they had to attack. So Gilgal is the headquarters, and then they're going to launch out from Gilgal to take Jericho. Well, I don't, I don't know if there's a, a, a city, <laughs> I wouldn't say thriving. Even Jericho is not all that thriving. A lot of these places have become merely uh, uh, tourist places to look at. Archaeologists will dig in certain places for a while. I don't think you're going to see any uh, community sign that says entering Gilgal population, whatever. It might even be smaller than Merkel. Okay. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Father, for being with us tonight. Your word means so much to us. Even as we read history and we watch people strive to do what you think, what, what they think that you want them to do, forgive us when we take things over, when we take things out of your hands, and we try to do it ourselves. In the name of Jesus, amen. All right, thanks for coming tonight. We'll pick it up again next week. Thanks for watching, everybody. And tune back in anytime you can. Talk to you guys later. Next, it'll be a month before I see you again, because it'll be February. It's now January. Tomorrow is February the 1st, is that right? Ah, there's Patty Joe. We had to do all this without you. It was very hard. Okay. Okay. Well, good. <laughs> That's right. A lot of these places have shrunk away. Yep.
the lady with the phone. <laughs> I normally turn it off, and I don't know why I didn't do it tonight. Do people not know that you're in some high-level um, event? That's the lady that I usually take shopping on Friday.